Welcome everyone. This is Jim from ISIP, and uh, it's my pleasure to have uh, one of our ISIP ambassadors, Larry Deacon, on. And Larry's going to tell us a little bit about who he is and his career, how he got to this point, and then a little bit about um, what it means to be the ambassador to APQC and what APQC stands for. So, Larry, over to you. Okay. Thanks a lot, Jim. Um, it's been good to know you for the last, oh, bunch of years. And uh, when uh, meeting at the lab, the Almaden lab, uh, the IBM Almaden lab. So I'm um, working with some of your folks there on some really interesting uh, kinds of kinds of projects. So um, I'm very pleased to have known you there and then through ISIP for the last last few years and doing some uh, tangential work with with ISIP. Um, I one of my themes in my dissertation in 2007 was uh, innovation uh, and it was around innovation leadership not leading innovation or innovating leadership but the, the complex or the intersection of the of the two because um, i found it very interesting at the time people were talking about innovation and they were saying the same thing about leadership and uh, in, in organizations um, about openness and direction and um, acceptance and uh, a number of things that were, were were parallel there, and so I wrote my dissertation around that. Um, and so coming out of that uh, doctoral work and my work with IBM in the healthcare industry and in a number of different startup consultation uh, startups and others, um, IBM business partners and not. Uh, came to start to learn and get a perspective on that there was a, a real seismic shift in what was happening from traditional organizational human resource psychology um, that began in the industrial revolution, industrial age, and was moving towards something in the future. And people were starting to talk about that, like Simon Sinek and, and, and others who were talking about a, a real fundamental shift uh, more towards uh, the people and the work that was being done and the people <laughs> and less about the organization and the structure and just delivering learning and development but actually really trying to train people for futures and one of the things that really interested me about you and ISIP was the emphasis on the t-shaped learner uh, where you have expertise in one maybe one particular vertical area, maybe a couple, but usually one. Um, but there was a horizontal bar across the top where lots of different kinds of what people have been talking about, soft skills. Mm -hmm. Like in the 90s, you could talk about emotional intelligence and people went, ooh, emotional intelligence. And now it's David Gurr, right? You can't go any place without people talking about emotional intelligence and making it part of onboarding and teaming and the rest of it. So those kinds of things have been really working their way into the fabric of organizations and, and HR. And when I studied for my diaconate and the Roman Catholic Church takes men at this point mm -hmm. who are um, usually have had a life, have had children, have had a career or a mid-career, um, and not people, younger people out of seminary like they did for priests, mm -hmm. more, more so. But those of us who have had some experience in the world to kind of bridge, we're going to talk about that later in ambassadorship, but bridging between the institution of the Catholic Church and the, the laity, the people of the church. Um, so in my um, training about that and the time I spent essentially in seminary, my wife and I did on weekends, um, it started to occur to me that a real mission for me as a deacon, besides parish work, would be in leveraging my organizational psychology work and started talking about human dignity. Mm -hmm. um, and who, you know, who are the people behind this work? And really, what is the intention of an organization to begin with? Um, prior to Industrial Revolution, people working in crafts and other, even other businesses would go through like an apprenticeship program and, you know, be interns, apprentices, 
um, go, go into journeying around uh, various places, learning other craftspeople's techniques, become master craftspeople themselves. Um, and then we're able to develop that and have that level of, of expertise. But after the Industrial Revolution, and Henry Ford, God bless him, making transportation affordable um, and later refrigerators for everybody. Um, and later international business machines making weight scales <laughs> affordable for everybody by mass producing. Um, all of that was good for the company and good for consumers and maybe good for the development of the world. Um, but then again, people then were started to be slotted into, um, well, do you put this part into there and do that day after day, after day, hour after hour, and you're just doing that. Um, or you got specialties like um, machinist or a foreman or whatever. You had a role and you worked to that role and that role was for the good of the organization. And then that was for the good of the shareholders. And then the role started to become more important than the person actually. Um, and so I think what we're seeing now in this great resignation I know that, that, that you've heard that term, Andy DeBell, um, uh, that we're facing now with lots of people leaving. Part of it is in response to, you know, folks like, I don't know if I can drop names, but like Elon Musk recently in the news said everybody's got to come back into the office and people who don't want to come back to the office can find some other place to work. And I think that's going to happen. Um, people will be finding other places. So people are getting pushed back or pushing back on coming back into the office and having the same old, same old um, in kinds of their relationship with the company and with each other um, and with their work. They want meaning, they want purpose. And I think underlying that is they really want, each of us wants to be dignified. You know, you want to be recognized. I want to be recognized, not just for what I do, but for just the person who I am and the unique gifts and talents, training, education, knowledge that I bring to any conversation, I want to have, I want to be dignified in that. Um, and I think that we're moving in a direction where we're saying, how do we be dignified to each other? And I think both the areas that I have bring that together. That's great. That's very clear. So I think we also, you also wanted me to talk a little bit about the ambassadorship. Yeah, let's, and thank you, Larry, for, before we go into the ambassadorship, I think, you know, you're right. The whole notion of social interactions and the roles we play in different social settings and being able to show up, I've heard um, uh, some other ambassadors, ISIP ambassadors talk about showing up as your authentic self and being uh, welcomed as your authentic self and being uh, able to contribute um, along multiple dimensions, not just a narrow role-based dimension is, uh, is um, of growing significance. And I do think we're at this, you know, they come up in history occasionally where there's a, a big social shift that's happening right now. The technology, of course, is driving parts of it, but. Um, but there's more to it than just technology. Uh, um, so thank you for, for that introduction. And um, uh, we would love to hear a little bit about APQC and your ambassador role. And I, I know I've already got like three or four things to thank you for on that uh, role, but just from your perspective, tell us a little bit about APQC. Well, APQC was um, first founded couple of decades, maybe longer <laughs> ago, um, around the idea of um, uh, process and process quality, uh, things that you and I have come to know as total quality management and lean processing and those kinds of things, which weren't coming out of APQC, but APQC was looking at uh, doing a lot of benchmarking around um, how processes are brought into organizations, how they are evaluated, qualified, how they are then modified and changed, and then what that looks like. So um, change management and such. But then they got into um, very early on, then looking at knowledge management, and then later into supply chain management, human capital management, a number of different areas of management and applying those same kinds of 
benchmarking qualities um, and approaches to each one of the studies they were doing. And then they had as members, like ISIP does, as corporate members, um, largely corporate members, including IBM and others, um, who uh, want to contribute to and also take part in the, um, the knowledge that comes out of these benchmarkings. And they, EPQC prides itself on having millions of data points in, in their in their processing and, and in their benchmarking. Um, one of the things that attracted me to them when I was working actually for uh, Sutter Health in Northern California, um, they were trying to get into, Sutter was um, trying to get into doing more knowledge management and figuring out what that was going to be like. And this was in the 2000s. Um, and so my role with them was to try to bring best practices around KM, knowledge management, um, to uh, th that organization. And that included things like communities of practice and, um, and dictionaries and taxonomies and some other things that also put me in touch with some of the people at your lab. Um, so we were um, working on that. I was working with APQC and I had a couple of annual conferences and then this other information that was coming out. One of the things that really piqued my interest with them was this KM maturity model. So I'm saying KM across KM these various aspects of knowledge management, then you can measure how far you've come as an organization relative to that. And so then it gives you an idea. Okay, well, this maybe is where we want to spend more budget <laughs> next year, more attention um, to getting this up to speed, and then you know trying to trying to get you know all top marks on all parameters um, eventually. But it gave um, a real plan, concrete plan for people. It was broad enough that it, you know it was benchmarking kinds of things, but it was specific enough that it was actionable. And I thought this is really good. So I was bringing that to, um, to Sutter Health to help each one of the disparate parts try to come together, at least on a plan. We weren't going to have a whole database for the whole organization all at once. Mm -hmm. um, there was stuff around HIPAA in terms of patient information that could not even be included in that. But in terms of practices and, and such, and developing communities of practice across disciplines and across all of Northern California where they were spread out. Yeah. So that was what attracted me to, to uh, APQC. When um, I retired and was getting into some of this work, it came up on my radar again, and I got hold of um, Cindy Hubert and some of the other, other folks there and said, you know, what are you, what are you doing these days? And there is actually a membership, which is just sort of opt-in. Um, it doesn't include everything because there's a lot of value. Yeah. monetary value to what proprietary value to what they have sure. but it does include a lot of things um, that, that comes from them and so i joined up there like i did with um i am have been with isaac yeah yeah and how do you see what kind of uh, in your role as isaac ambassador I, I know already you've talked about um trying to uh you know, doing a blog that will help ISAP members learn about more about APQC. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. We wish more ambassadors would do blog posts about the organization and resources that ISAP members might have. But any additional thoughts on uh, where you uh, would like to play a role as a bridge connecting ISAP and APQC? Yeah, on this particular one, as you mentioned, um, a blog post I did on my own uh, blog, um, DLHP uh, Consulting. And I um, started it out with, okay, what are the two entities? And I like to keep my blogs just a couple of paragraphs. I don't like yeah. to go on and on. Yeah, yeah. Um, so <laughs> some people don't get frustrated when they get to the third paragraph without seeing the end. Um, but then I'm going to do a part two, um, which is more, and a part three, which is what can each organization offer to the other? Um, mm, nice. So people may not want to go to APQC and join up and fill out all of the you know the forms and get the emails and the newsletters and, and all of that and sign up for that. But they might be interested in something that is publicly available that you know I may be able to go out and look for. Do they have this kind of a thing? Somebody from ISA could ask me that question. Yeah. Same with APQC and the members who are there 
um, they can ask me about IZIP and maybe some things that might be going on there that may not be on the website, but you or some others may know that there is research going on in this area or mm -hmm. practice in this other area. More formally, eventually, hopefully, you know, the different people can work on different benchmarking projects together you know, mm -hmm. yep. by filling in and also in, in the results. So I'm, I'm looking at those kinds of relationships um, eventually, but over the next week or so, you know, take a look for the part two and part three on the blog post. Great. Well, thank you, Larry. It's been great to learn about your background and your focus these days on human dignity. Thanks so much for being an ISAP ambassador, telling us about APQC and your plans for bridging that. And uh, any last words or advice for ISAP leadership that you would like to offer in your role as, uh, as uh, SAGE? <laughs> <laughs> um well, you know, in terms of approaching these uh, ambassadorships, if you will, I mean, mm -hmm. ISIP has I mean, certainly its own membership and its own, uh, all of these people with all kinds of expertise and are bring, you, you doing a great job and Yossi did and Michelle and such moving forward into like discovery summits and such so right. people can share the information on the ISIP side. There are a lot of other folks out there, human system dynamics and uh, other people who are gathering, trying to, really address the intractable issues of our time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we've got really smart people everywhere who don't necessarily fall into the same circles mm -hmm. um, and ambassadors like your, mm -hmm. yourself, you do this all the time. Um, we talked about Nick D'Onofrio from IBM <laughs> serving this role. And his, new being, book, his new book, it, we got to plug his new book. His oh, plug his, go ahead. It is. Yeah, it's called If Nothing Changes, Nothing Changes, the Nick D'Onofrio story. And it's a wonderful, wonderful book. He, he Actually, he uh, had Sam Ponzano, the former CEO of IBM and other people write little blog sections, like little mini blogs inside the book about things that Nick was writing about. It's a fantastic uh, autobiography. And um, if nothing changes, nothing changes. So, yeah. It's the top of my reading list, really. Um, so, uh, but the, the, those of us who, you know, know, well, there's smart people <laughs> all over the place. There and are. <laughs> if they get together um, around certain issues, like start discussing the future of expertise, what is that going to look like? What does that mean? You know, all of those questions are going to ask on June 29th, um, those 2022. <laughs> yeah. But all of those questions, um, those, those are important questions that getting these different opinions and these well you know i i want to just uh double down on what you're saying because you've crystallized something in my head larry that was tacit knowledge that just became explicit knowledge and i want to thank you for this because um i loved being part of ibm for 23 years and part of the reason i loved it was because you Inside of IBM, people treated each other with respect and dignity in general. I mean, very much so. And it was so many cultures, so many industries, so much diversity inside of IBM. But you, but you felt part of it and you knew, and Nick D'Onofrio was a great example of this. If you send an email, a short email where I need help on X to Nick, I'm not joking. Typically within five minutes, sometimes you would get a response back, go talk to so-and-so or, or even maybe a few paragraphs if he was the guy who could help you with the specific thing. And, and being part of a global network where you can get answers to questions, knowing that somebody in this network, the answer to this question is easy. You know, they'll give me what to read or who to, they'll give me the pointer I need to the person or the resource. And if we could make ISIP like that, where everybody in ISIP just feels they're, they're part of something that's global, where they can get, you know, when they ask a question respectfully, you know, a short, concise, I need help with this, there's something that comes back quickly, that would be amazing. So uh, thank you for uh, helping gel that in my mind, because I think ambassadors play a critical role. And, and ISAP members who can get to know all of the ambassadors, you're basically building your connection network to who you can ask questions and get back you know, um, responses. Yeah, to I totally agree. I spent um, 
uh, almost 20 years off and on with, with IBM during that time. And the same thing. And the, the, the dignity and the honor with which you were afforded from the outset, if you know, um, mm -hmm. in, in meeting some and whatever it was um, refreshing and warming, you know, it, 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 it removed a lot of barriers to genuine interaction, you know, with others, um, because you didn't have to feel judged to approve yourself or whatever, you were just accepted, you know, for whom we were. And because you were with IBM, and they say you have this kind of expertise, then Darn it, that's what you're here. We're treated <laughs> as an expert in that area, a go-to person, absolutely. All right, Larry, I think we've uh, gone on a little bit longer than our five minutes short. Uh, that we you can edit. <laughs> no, 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 this is, this is great the way it is, Larry. Thank you again so much, Larry, for being an ISAP ambassador, and I will stop the recording. All right, got to figure out how to do it there.